Monday, February 1st, 2016. This is the Cabarrus County Board of Education work session. I'll call this meeting to order. Um, first off, we need to set the agenda, and before we do that, I'd like to recognize our SRO for tonight. Ms. Sharon Deese is over here from Harrodsburg Elementary. Sharon, thank you for coming out tonight. Before we proceed with actually setting the agenda, I would like to get a motion to remove 5.07 from the agenda and we'll just table it to a future date. So moved. Uh, Rob Walter makes the motion that we remove it. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Dr. Phillips seconds that. All in favor of removing 5.07 from the agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right, now I need a motion to approve the agenda for the February 1st, 2016 work session. So moved. Mr. Harrison, moved. Do I have Dr. Phillips seconds it. All in favor of the agenda as written, uh, as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries 7-0. Um, as you will see tonight, we're actually sitting with a different arrangement. We're trying to uh, create more of a work session uh, venue, and so if the public will bear with us, this is an experiment for us to try this different uh, arrangement. Uh, so we may have a few little glitches as we work through this, uh, and uh, there is definitely a learning curve here. But uh, that will lead us into our report. 3.01 is the update on Wolf Meadow. The balance calendar and Ms. Reimer, you're ready to go, right? Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, wanted to give you an update on our balance calendar and where we are with, uh, with that right now. This update tonight, we want to give you the process that we use to communicate with all the parents and to collect all of our data. We want to give you the student opt-out data. We want to talk about the students that are now choosing Wolf Meadow as a magnet and then talk about our transportation costs for the opt-out students. <coughs> so. We, uh, on January 4th, we sent a letter home uh, with every K-4 student, a letter of intent. On January 6th, we did Blackboard Connect Eds uh, to discuss door-to-door -door transportation and make sure there, that was clarified. On January 12th and 14th, we did two more Blackboard Connect Ed messages to remind parents to return their intents. January 13th, we had an open house to for, uh, inform parents of opt-out, magnet uh, options, and for transportation. January 4th through the 15th, during that week, the principal contacted every parent who answered no or maybe on an uh, intent letter to try to make sure they understood the entire intent of the balance calendar and answer any questions that they may have. January 19th through the 22nd, the admin and staff contacted any parents that did not turn in an intent by phone. And then uh, January 19th through 22nd, we also sent certified letters <coughs> to all those that could not be reached by phone. At this point, we have 100% of every student accounted for, 487 out of 487 of the intents have been returned or a parent contacted. At this point, we have 444 that are staying at Wolf Meadow and 43 that are choosing to opt out. Out of our opt-out students, we have 43, 7 will be going to Urban, we have 17 at Weddington Hills, we have 17 at Rocky River. And we have two students that are uh, children of uh, teachers that are currently on the transfer list. That's kind of hard to see at the bottom of that, but here are the students that have applied now to Wolf Meadow through our magnet process. We have a total of 51, and as you can see, they come from a wide variety of our elementary schools. Let's talk about transportation for just a second. So this is our transportation diagram and a route for those students that we're going to transfer from Wolf Meadow to Rocky River. If you look at the right, uh, initially, I want to kind of go through the estimate and then we'll talk about the, the, the picture itself. So the transportation estimate is a 24.37 miles extra or outside of the zone. And we have a 3.11 driver cost per mile that is set by our state. And uh, I do want to kind of brag about our transportation department there just for a second. That is much lower than many across the state. It's based on our efficiency and how well we, um, how well we do uh, transporting students. So that is a $3.11 per mile. And then uh, we do that for 180 days. So we have $75 a day 
times 180 days and it gives you uh, that cost. What you can't see there with the little gray is, is also a cost of a bus. So uh, Rocky River is on Tier 2. We do not have any available buses on Tier 2. And as you can see, the red line that you see is outside of their zone. So that red line does depict where we'll have to take a bus to pick those kids up. And with no buses available, we will have to purchase a bus for that. Um, in, the, in a few seconds, you'll see, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see the breakdown of how we actually uh, put that money in. And what, what we say is that uh, this is one tier out of three tiers. And so if we have to purchase a bus, which we will, this will be tier two. Yes, sir. There, there is a lead time of more than a year for a bus, so I'm going to put a hitch in there for our, our budget committee to look at how many we're asking for this year. But So what does that mean? Will we be using some of our growth buses that we possibly get this year and have ordered in the past to try to fulfill this? So there is a lead time of a year. Yes, sir, you are correct. So, <clears throat> however, when we look at this, Tier 1 and Tier 3 of that bus, the new bus will still be able to be used for other schools or other tiers to transport students. So we only take one third of the cost and actually apply it to this estimate. We didn't feel like it was a fair estimate to say that we had to use that bus just for uh, the students going to Rocky River. So that's Rocky River. Uh, total cost there is $41,975 to transport from Wolf Meadow to Rocky River. And, yes, sir. Uh, and of that, um, it's only the non bus costs that will be recurring, right? The, the 28000 is just the first year, but going beyond this, if we can Correct. offer this this way, it would be the 13000 know. Yes, sir. If the board if the board were to continue with that, yes. Yes, the, yes. Right. The, the cost would not be the bus any longer, um, but just the, the cost of transportation. So from Wolf Meadow to Weddington Hills, you can see the route there. And we use the exact same formula, obviously. And Weddington Hills is also on Tier 2. And there are no bu buses available. And so, therefore, that would be a second bus that we would have to purchase. Again, only using one-third of that bus because there are three tiers. And the first and third tier would be able to be used to transport other students. Um, and it's hard. Again, I can't see the, the amount there on this frame. That's all I have in front of me. Finally is Wolf Meadow to Irvin. And you can see Wolf Meadow to Irvin. We do not purchase a third bus based on the fact that Irvin is on the first tier. And we can use the current bus, which was one of the reasons why Irvin was one of our recommendations, although we recognize the board's wishes to uh, give parents options. Uh, the purpose of Irvin being our first uh, choice was that they're on the same tier, and those students that are outside that zone are very close to the Irvin zone, and, and therefore, um, does not cost as much, and certainly uh, no purchase of uh, extra equipment there. Yes, sir. Um, do we have an approximate um, number of minutes that a mile equates to? We've said 20-some miles and 30-some miles, and now 17.74 miles. How many minutes is that on the bus? Uh, if, if you don't have it, that's, that's fine, but I just want to impress on people that the 30-mile bus uh, trip for their children would be X number of minutes if we were able to guesstimate that or approximate that. We, we can work on that for you. We do not have that in our presentation now, but I can certainly ask transportation to take a look at that for us. Thank you. So in conclusion, with all three zones, uh, two buses, and the total cost uh, to actually <coughs> transport once we have that equipment is $98,108. And it's very hard for me to see this. I'm going to have to wear my glasses back here. Um, so this is just kind of, kind of puts it all together in one little chart. And it goes through Rocky River and, and the cost to actually do that. And kind of explains again the Tier 2 uh, from Wolf Meadow to Weddington and Wolf Meadow to Irvin. It talks about the bus, that we have to buy two buses needed. And then it divides it by three, so it shows you where we get that money. And then it talks about the $3.11 uh, for the driver cost, again, set by the state. Uh, and then our final estimate of $98,108. Now that's, now that's, I don't know, I don't know. Now that's
that's just the first year. You said it would go down the second, third year, correct? Yes, ma'am. The first year, um, based on the purchase of, of two buses, uh, the equipment uh, that would it cost that it would cost to get those buses on tier two, and then the following year we would not have to purchase those buses again. We would just have to use the actual transportation cost, which is the mileage times the bus uh, driver's cost. And again, we're only talking about the children that opt out, and we're not talking about the summer program or anything else. We're only talking about the opt out children, which is a total of 43 children. 43 children, yes. And we're not talking anything about the other children that are the ones that are coming from the other 50 one or anything that are coming from other schools, correct? That is correct. Only the students that are choosing to leave or opt out of Wolf Meadow. Okay. Nice. 43 students, yes ma'am. Okay. So, so of the 100,000 <clears> or 98,000, 41 442, so 41,000 and change will be a recurring expense for transportation every year after this year, essentially. Essentially, yes, sir. Okay. Now, in the, um, I know last March we were presented and it was said that two buses would be roughly 90,000 a piece and then in October we had a presentation when we voted that there were going to be no transportation costs that was part of that um, presentation um, associated with this year-round calendar <clears throat> of course transportation wasn't provided for those that were forced to move so now we've got $100,000 this year in transportation costs that um, weren't, were not presented in October when we voted on it. Um, that just seems like a lot to spend to go to a year-round calendar to me. You know? But I guess so there's nothing we can do about it now. Um, <clears throat> to spend the money and not have it to spend somewhere else, I guess. Yeah. The, the presentation and the recommend, uh, recommendation from the staff obviously was not to provide transportation, but once the board uh, did vote that direction and ask us to do that, this is, is the estimate that we came up with. The, uh, the kids that are offered to come to Wolf Meadow, now they're providing their own transportation, correct? That is correct. Okay. And we do not have any any idea of costs for the summer programs until probably it happens. We d we we can come up with an estimate for that if you ask me to come up for an estimate for that. Um, it's probably going to be in the ballpark of fifty thousand dollars for some of that. It's not. I mean, that's a guesstimate for sure. But if you direct me to do that, I'd be happy to come up with that for you. <clears throat> by summer, you mean the intersections? Yes, sir. So it's not. Yeah, but yeah. I don't. I do what you, you meant, but I just want to make sure. I will add to that, uh, Mr. Fur, that uh, I'm working with Mr. Auerbach. They have they have been able to uh, get some funding to, to try to help with some of that. We're not sure exactly where they are and, and how much they have fully secured, but there will be some. So, Mr. Uh, Dr. Reimer, if I may. Um, Sometimes in the public content of the agenda online, the staff puts their formal recommendation in there, and that's not in this particular one. Without putting words in your mouth, can you tell me your recommendation again, please? So initially the staff recommendation was to not provide transportation for the students that were choosing to opt out. However, I think the board pretty much directed us to give you that estimate, and, and that was your intent, and so... This is a board request, and at your request, here's our $100,000. If you ask me again, would my, my recommendation be the same as it was to begin with? Yes, sir. So you've confirmed your original feeling uh, or your kind of intuition. You've quantified it here for us. That it, And again, this is putting words in your mouth, so we'll say they're my words. 
that it's cost prohibitive. It would not be the recommendation of the staff. Okay. Yeah, this hundred thousand dollars is on us. Right. It's on the board. It's not on the staff. No, no. But they've quantified it for me. No, sir. We have not looked at a head stop for these students. We got the directive to go door by door, pretty much stops, and that's the direction we took. Could possibly. I think I've been somewhat surprised as I've learned transportation, how expensive hub stops are as well. But I think it could reduce some, but I couldn't tell you exactly how much. We can certainly check into that if you wish. Um, we, we probably need a new bus in any case, right? Because we need multiple buses in general. I, I will say that we're asking, if you're part of the budget committee, you know we, we are asking for multiple buses for growth, and this adds to that. Are you um, saying that, um, uh, are we saying that this cost hypothetically would come from fund balance? Where would, where would this happen from if we chose to go down that path? Okay, so that is a Kelly Klutz question, and I'll refer to her. Um, so our um, capital cost for the bus, is it, is it on? Yeah, these don't work. These don't work. They have to use that one. I have to use that one. Yeah, but it's not going to go that far. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So the capital cost would be um, something that we're asking the county for and that we always do. So um, the, the number of buses that we're asking for is 20 in the budget committee this year. So a portion of those or one of those um, we come from there. Um, that, that also means that we have to, if we get 10 of those buses and we really need 12 and this adds on another two-thirds of a bus, then that means we're compromised and, and we have to make decisions in the transportation department that impact our students. It could be longer routes, it could be, um, you know, further distances to, um, that, that kids have to walk, um, those kinds of things. But whatever the number of buses that we get, we're requesting 20. If we get 12, then we have to make that fit, transportation does. So that cost is a capital cost, and, and we'll get those dollars from the county. And then, of course, you have the transportation cost. There's two funding sources um, for the operating, two funding sources for transportation. One is state transportation dollars, and the other is local transportation dollars. We already exceed the state allotment by about a couple million dollars, and that comes out of local. Um, we've tried to reduce that number, that local number, over the years, but essentially if, if you decide to um, increase the cost associated, there's, there's nothing we can do except for fund that from local. And so that's, a, again, as you said, a $41,000 reoccurring cost that um, we'll have every year until you change your decision. And this is not, a, not necessarily a financial question, but with um, uh, voting to make Wolf Meadow a year-round program, um, and about 90, give or take 90 percent of the existing students have, and families have decided to stay with that program and continue year-round. What, what are we, I know we're talking about $98,000 here is, for the first year, are we saving anything in transportation costs with the students who are going to stay at Wolf Meadow? So I think that's a good question and one that I had as well. Actually, probably not because the routes that they ran before, well, they'll still have to run even though they're not picking up a student here or a student there. So if all these students had come from the exact same area, you could probably say possibly. But now that they're, they're not, it's the bus routes are still going to be very similar. So this is still a net increase of approximately the 98000 or something close to it. There's not some cost savings on the other end. No, sir. I just want to go down, down that, that path to be sure. Thank you. The, the only thing that really concerns me, just am I? Am I? Yeah. Uh, the only thing that concerns me in one aspect is we try to be equitable to everybody, all children. And what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we wouldn't get a bus for the children from Royal Oaks when we had 20-something children that when we were taking them 
to the having to take them to another school we said ah we can't buy a bus for them and you know when we were doing that transfer and you know that that was too much and we couldn't do that when we wanted to do transportation or even thought about it and trying to be equitable for everyone and I know this is a new program and then we we wanted to look at it we asked for the cost and we've seen the cost now and it's it's a pretty big chunk and we're already asking for 20 something buses and we don't know if we'll get that uh, but again we have to look at what's equitable and that that is a concern I have I'm, I mean I'm just putting that concern out there after we've already told one group of parents hey sorry uh, we can't afford a bus and then we turn around we say okay we're gonna get two buses and and that is a concern of mine I'm just putting that concern out there because we did tell those other ones we can't afford a bus so that's just something to consider maybe two last questions um, maybe the good news is that we now have a formula maybe we, maybe we always did have a formula of three dollars and eleven cents per mile and, and all the other variables in here but every time we talk about transportation this is basically going to be the formula is kind of what I'm hearing all, all of the things being equal um, so what happened I don't mean this is a rhetorical question. What happens to the 43 students whose families are having especially difficult times um, with transportation and with the schedule? I, I don't expect here and now to have an answer to that, but um, it's, it's not a theoretical question. It's real to those families. Sure. And I mean it for all of us, not just for yourself, Dr. Reimer. What happens to those families? Uh, I mean, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, but I'm not sure what, um, what, you know, what else we can do from our end in terms of helping with the, the transition. I certainly understand the question and understand the, the hardship and the fear of the hardship for families. I do believe that uh, we're going to see, and this is just my personal belief, a, a really positive thing at, at Wolf Meadow. and. Um, I think data shows that, and people we've spoken to in the last week uh, say that as well. But I do certainly understand your question and, and do not have an answer for that. Dr. Phillips? Dr. Phillips? You know, I, I don't have any questions. I have just going to make a few comments. First, I just remind everyone on the board that um, Wake County has a number of year round schools, and for every single one of them, they offer transportation out of the year-round school boundary to the alternative school. So this is not something unique that we would be doing. Um, also, say, I, I'm impressed that there's more parents that want to come in than go out. And uh, I mean, look at this. There, there are students that are even coming from um, Odell on the far western side of the county. So we, we may actually be getting a little bit of relief in some of our more uh, crowded schools just just by having this uh, this option available and um, finally i would just remind everyone that we are now in competition uh, you don't have to go to cabarrus county schools and um, i think if you do the calculation of how much we're spending per student uh, we're still going to net out positive and if we lost these students to the competition Any other comments? All right. Thank you, Mr. Our board members, that carries us to item number four. I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Um, Mr. Yeah. Shoemaker. Just a kind oh. of a procedural question as we move from, from this topic. This this is a report, so there's no vote on this? There's no vote for this particular item. We could uh, put it up for vote in... Uh, I could have a motion to say that you would want to have something on uh, some type of uh, vote in our business meeting if someone wanted to move that so that we vote on this uh, tra transportation plan. But at this point, there was not, uh, we weren't thinking that there would need, need to be a vote because the board already made the policy that we were going this route. 
So if someone wants to make a motion that to to vote on this transportation plan as outlined here uh, tonight, then uh, they could so do it, and then we would put it on the action agenda for next for our next meeting to be actually voted on. So it would just a vote on putting it on the action agenda is what I would look at. It wouldn't be a vote on the motion, just a vote on moving this to an action item for the next meeting. Does that sound correct, Mark? Yes, I think I think you would want to. Since the board voted to provide the transportation, really, if someone wants to change that vote, you'd have to then have an agenda item to consider whether the transportation is provided. Because I think as it stood, the board, you know, said we're going to provide transportation, ask for information, how much it's going to cost. So you've gotten a report tonight saying this is the budgetary impact. So that's you're right. I don't think there's an action. If someone wanted to, you know, propose an action to be taken up next week, then a board member would need a make a motion and say, I'd like a, an action item for next week to do whatever, to either not provide transportation or look for other funding, but that, that's, I think that would be the right procedure. Wouldn't we have to try, I thought we were going to vote on a transportation plan or for, approve of a transportation plan. I don't think we set that in stone last time on what the transportation that, plan was. That was my understanding too. We, we just yeah. asked for the information. It was my understanding we still needed to vote on the plan but I see this is a report. Um, is that what your understanding is? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you know, we go back and look at the resolution, whether we, we said, you know, we're going forward or, or not. But I, I know that in the discussion, we said, hey, look, parents need to know whether we're going to offer transportation or not when they make their, their vote as to whether to stay or go. And so let's tell them we're going to offer transportation. But with the caveat that if the number's too big, we're gonna have to go back to them and say, "Hey, look, it's too big. We can't. We can't. This is more than we thought it was gonna be." Um, so I, I think it is appropriate to have a, a vote next week to say, "All right, now that we've seen the data, you know, let's let's make a decision. Is this still still the way we want to go, or or not?" And and I say that as somebody who thinks this is the way we should go. But I, I also think that we need to be. Uh, together on this and and I don't want anyone to think like we've we're forcing this down anyone's throat well I think a good it, a good point is also that the the presentation has changed since I was able to view it I think it's kind of increased some of the numbers we I guess we got information back from parents and the financial impact impact has changed a little bit since I was able to view it so um, that's just a kind of maybe it's a procedural concern, but um, I've raised the issue before with other presentations that we need to, you know, if we're going to give it to the board to look at ahead of time, then maybe it, it, it should match what we see up here. I, don't, I know it's, I, I get it, I understand the information came in late, but in other cases it hasn't. Just, that's just a concern. And I will, clarify, I will clarify that, that today, to speak of, um, Mr. Albarque was uh, has called numerous times and was able to get all three of the three that were remaining. Uh, when I sent the uh, PowerPoint to Ms. Monroe, I told her that we'd be updating regularly so that she could have it and have it posted in time. Uh, and, and knowing that we would have parents that we wouldn't be able to contact, that's, that's how it happened. So. something I might like to see the upstop cost and I'd also like to see if we um, since we know how many students we have now if we if that's enough that can be accommodated at one school that we just choose one school and see if we can just do it with one bus instead of having to go through a hundred thousand dollars what are you saying okay Sorry. are you saying just give <coughs> one choice the school I'm saying if that's gonna uh, our if that is our ability to still provide transportation if that's all we can do then that would be a something to consider. Uh, you know, I, I'll just add a little something since we're going to meet this thing a while. Uh, you know, when, when that was first presented to us, uh, you know, I was really impressed with the, with the uh, with Wood Meadow and their staff and, and wanting to do something different, kind of out of the box to for their students, and, and I applaud them for that. And also, uh, I, like I, I may have said in an earlier meeting, that I talked to some people in Union County who who did this to similar to similar schools like Wolf Meadow, and they were 
and highly recommended it, and that sold that sold me. But I still think maybe this we should learn a lesson from this little exercise, because I made a comment a long time ago that we may have put the cart before the horse. You know, to me, I don't want money to ever get in the way of educating the student. But when we look in the big picture and then look at the budget process, we we probably need the full. Uh, calls before we make a deciding vote, but like I said, I still I, I have no uh, regrets about doing this. Since since by and large this decision was made based on the curriculum curricular interests of Wolf Meadow and how the academics were going to be impacted and so forth, would it be possible to find have the financial impact? impact curriculum instead of transportation this was not done because of transportation but yet it's going to take the financial impact could we maybe move part of the 1.1 million that we use on digital resources that are subscription based is that possible to move some of that over maybe that's a kelly klutz question Depends on the consequence that you want to deal with. So um, I know that there are a significant number of schools and students and teachers that um, believe that our digital resources are necessary and, and a good spend of our money. Um, so if, if you, as a board, want to make that decision, then certainly that's um, something that you can do. We, uh, we are contractually bound to <coughs> certain things, and so those uh, contractions will need to be reviewed by our attorney to see if those we can get out of those but if that is the desire of the board uh, we will do so does that have to come before the board or could that have just just taken place under the guidelines I guess set forth would that have to be a board vote could that just take place in the normal operating way of operating so those, the dollars that are allocated have been selected to use for digital resources. So if, you're, if, if we're being directed to do something that we have not decided to do, then yes, the board needs to give us direction to undo a decision that was made by the administration and do what the board has uh, asked us to do. Okay, my, my suggestion was just that I think it probably could have been done before coming to the board just to make this adjustment uh, financially to make it happen. Um, but now it's come before the board to, I guess, make that decision next week um, whether to provide or not provide, which is fine. Mm -hmm. There's been no decision, and I'll read the motion that was made back in <clears throat> December. And a motion was made by Dr. Jeff Phillips and seconded by Mr. Vince Powell that the board approve the Wolf Mellow Balance Calendar opt-out assignment plan to include Weddington Hills, W.M. Irvin, and Rocky, Rocky River Elementary School. Further, the school district will offer door-to-door -door transportation for students to the opt-out schools. This plan will be revisited in March 2016 once the cost of transportation is known and parents who opt out may change that decision if the board decides in March that it is unable to provide door-to-door -door transportation. The motion was unanimously approved. In that, the only caveat was is if we bring forth a motion to disapprove the plan, the board was willing to go with the plan back in December. So now we've got it, the numbers before us, so it's really up to us do we want to go, not go forward with this plan because I don't see there's a need for us to vote for it. All of us have voted for this. And then if, if, the, if we're choking on the number, then that's why we would offer up a, a, a motion to put this on next, next week's uh, action agenda. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I'll put it on, ask to be put on to discuss again if there's um, still providing transportation, but if there's a, a I will need a motion 
so that we could, because this was a report, so it's not a formal, so I need a motion to put this on the next month's action, like or next week's action I'd like agenda. to make a motion to put it on the action agenda. Is okay, I need, I need a second for that I'll, motion. I'll second that. All right, so we have a motion to put the transportation plan and costs on the action agenda for next week. Um, that motion, excuse me? Does mean we've got to talk about it for another 40 minutes? No, week? we're just going to put it on there and move yeah. on. We'll talk about it for 40 minutes next week. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I think I think Mr. Walter asked for a couple of other options to, to be uh, costed out, so we'll obviously have to talk about that. We do need some direction there. I need to make sure because some of the things that were presented are very significant changes. Um, and so if that's part of what we bring before we vote, then there's a lot of information that we're looking at and a fairly radical change of the plan because um, we first suggested Irvin because that was the cheapest, as, as Ms. Reimer demonstrated. <clears throat> then we kind of said, well, we believe staying with your peer group through middle school changes that. If that's the case, then even if you have hub stops, you have three different buses. It's on two different tiers. You still have to buy two buses. So that's $50,000 before you even start the plan. And I think that's what Ms. Reimer was saying. It may not be $98,000, but it's certainly going to be seventy five or more. It's going to be in that boat. Now, we can get that answer, but that's still very different than are we going to keep those peer groups together. So if we're going to do that, then you're really changing what we presented in December. Well, hold on just a moment. Mr. Walter, what else did you want them to study? Because the intercession, they don't, they're not ready to provide that transportation cost at all. The well, the intercession um, <coughs> activities, you, I think you brought that up, and I'd ask Chris about it when he thought what he I, could have it. What I mentioned is before we had no idea how many students would be opting out. We know now we have 40 students. And my thought, my, my brain here, that's one bus. Um, so if that's one bus that picks up 40 students, and if we have a school that can absorb 40 students, that would be an option, a, a lot cheaper option, or at least a lot more economical option, that we can still provide door-to-door -door service, but it's not going to cost us 100000 plus a recurring expense. That was my thought process. I don't know what, how that adds up or, or what school that would be, but, again, that's where I'm thinking. I think that the danger in that is then you have to resurvey the 43 kids because now they have a different choice in front of them and that's that's where the problem would would come up yeah. is then maybe well I'm not going to opt out you know see so that's where right it gets but tricky. if we're going to make any change to it they have the option yeah, to, really to re yeah. revisiting their decision right but that's really is a bait and switch I mean this board you man unanimously approved door to door and, and and the only reason you would vote this down is if this is too big a number to, and you're going to choke on it and you literally can't live with it. And if you're going to can't live with it, then that, you need to vote it down completely and, and just decide what you want to do. But these people did make a commitment based on the way we made this motion last month, and we made sure that we articulated that to every single parent that it was that this is what the board was planning to do. And and, and my intent, my thinking in talking to each of you was this was what everybody really wanted. So. Um, if it's too much, then, uh, we, you know, we've got a motion before us. Mr. Walter has made a motion that we uh, put this on the action agenda for next week, and Dr. Phillips has seconded that motion. Do I have any more discussion? I mean, there's no way we can back, back out of giving those people choices with the three schools. That there's, there's no, we can't do that. I don't care about the money. I mean, you can't just do that. It's just my 10 cents. Okay. All right, board members, I just need you to vote on this motion. Is there any more discussion on it? Seeing none, hearing none. Uh, all in favor of moving the transportation item to next week's agenda, say aye. 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 Okay. So we'll vote on that next week. Um, I, I don't I don't hear anything that says that we change that they change what they offer what they provide to us. I was a no, by the way. Oh, you were a no? Okay, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. You didn't ask for what? <laughs> My fault. <laughs> Forgive me, Tim. No problem. <laughs> I, I didn't hear any further information actually needed because, you know, if you send it all of, all to, um, in Mr. Walter's case, he, he wanted to send them all, all to Irving. I just don't know if you can get them all there because of the spread outness, but, you know, that's a whole other transportation issue. You still have the miles. But 
Um, Y'all, if, if someone will write me, if they have something that they want them to research, let me, let me know tonight after the meeting. All right, that moves us on to section four. These are the items for our consent agenda. And the first, uh, this is a, on the first reading, it's the board authority and duties. I didn't see any um, feedback on that. Is that okay to move to the consent agenda? Yes, sir. Oh, I, I think Mr. Harris. Do your best yes. to make sense of what I attempted to. I, uh, I did. Yes, yes So, so That's what right. we're right. we're adding a line to this provision that references the Leandro case decision, and I think Mr. Harrison had asked for you know, a little bit of background on what that decision is, what it says about education, and whether that's been now adopted into law, and some guidance if we're going to say we're going to follow Leandra, what does that really mean? So I, if you give me a couple minutes, I, I think that's a great question, and a good, good opportunity to actually review a little bit of the history of Leandra. A lot of us you know, know about the case, but it's a case that was decided a while ago and has quite a history after. So, um, but it was a 1997 case that was decided by the North Carolina Supreme Court. Leandro was actually a student. The plaintiffs were several students in low wealth school districts, a number of um, high poverty counties. Hope County ended up being the, the name plaintiff on the subsequent lawsuit after Leandro aged out of the uh, school system. But he was a student that brought the claim. They were essentially saying that the North Carolina Constitution guaranteed them a sound basic education and that they were being deprived of that in their schools because they were not learning, they were not able to go out and get jobs, they didn't have the money and the resources. And it challenged the way the state allocated money between the different districts because we had so-called low wealth districts and high wealth districts and the lawsuit was against not just the state but Charlotte Mecklenburg and Wake and the other counties that had more money, more money mainly from local dollars and we're basically arguing it was a disparity um, and it was decided by the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Burley Mitchell who I'm proud to say is now one of my partners at Womble Carlisle wrote the opinion um, and he wrote that an education does not serve the purpose of preparing students to participate and compete in the society in which they will live and work if it is devoid that fails to provide that is devoid of substance and is constitutionally inadequate. Um, the, the opinion says we believe that decisions about schools belong with government agencies, the Board of Education, the state, not the courts, but if there's a fundamental failure to provide uh, a basic education to students, then the courts will get involved and order recourse. I think the key thing for us deciding whether to adopt the agree to provide what Leandro calls for is how um, the Supreme Court of North Carolina defined a sound basic, basic education under the Constitution. And they said there are four components, and this is a quote from the decision. The first is um, they must provide students with sufficient ability to read, write, and speak the English language and a sufficient knowledge of fundamental mathematics and physical science to enable the student to function in a complex and rapidly changing society. So it's the language arts and mathematics and science to, to function in today's society. Second, sufficient fundamental knowledge of geography, history, and basic economic and political systems to enable the student to make informed choices with regard to issues that affect the student personally or affect the student's community, state, and nation. Third, sufficient academic and vocational skills to enable the student to successfully engage in post-secondary education or vocational training. And fourth, sufficient academic and vocational skills to enable the student to compete on an equal basis with others in further formal education or gainful employment in contemporary society. So that's what the Supreme Court said a sound basic education was. You've got to provide fundamental skills in these different areas. Um, that was decided in, in 1997, as I mentioned. The actual subsequent case, including Hope County, has continued, and there were decisions as recently as 2013, and the case is still pending. And Judge Manning, who is the trial judge, is still involved. And there have been a number of different challenges to funding proposals. The biggest was a decision 
in 2004 that because no pre-K education was provided um, to students that the state had, had failed to meet its basic education to students because they were unable to learn to read and write. And there were several appeals on that. Ultimately, there was an appeal to the, to the Court of Appeals which held, upheld the decision on pre-K. The legislature then changed the rules regarding um, pre-K and the Supreme Court said that change mooted it. So we don't have any other Supreme Court cases under the long Leandro um, uh, lineage. I, I looked it up today. There are now 556 cases that have cited to or relied on the Leandro decision. So this is really a landmark in education, and it's. Um, and I haven't read all 556 uh, myself, but it's a it's a huge body of law surrounding Leandro. Uh, Mr. Harrison, one of your questions was, well, has this been adopted by statute? How does it apply to the board? I mean, there are a number of. Um, statutes that obviously address some of the components of what a basic education is, everything from the North Carolina curriculum to a lot of the guidance that's provided in the general statutes. But I do think it's fair to say that the, the court requirement to provide a basic education arguably goes beyond what may be required under the General Assembly statutes. And so you know, there's still arguments about whether simply complying with those statutes provides a sound basic education. I do think that what the board can decide in adopting this policy is do we want to adopt and support, you know, the Leandro's definition of a sound basic education, uh, which I provided. Um, I think that's, that's kind of the issue. I would, if we were not doing it, we could potentially be sued for not providing that um, sound basic education. No one has done that. I think, you know, we, we think we provide a pretty good education to our students in comparison, pride ourselves on giving them the tools to compete in the ways that were addressed by the system. So I think our students are fortunate in that regard. But I think that's, this, this is a change from the policies to lead the school. It's not my language to add Leandro. I think they're suggesting school boards reference it in a way to say, hey, we know that this requirement's out here and it's one of the things that we as boards will try to do is provide that education. But the language is optional. From my perspective, you can stick with the old language on policy 1010 if you want. But I think that's the intention, and, and that's the history. Well, I, I, you know, philosophically support Leandro. That said, all the questions in the 500 and some odd cases still pending, don't, none of that needs my action. It needs to work its way through the courts and all get resolved, and it needs legislative votes and actions to put into material terms the final determinations of Leandro. <clears throat> Me down here at one little school board in North Carolina and several others putting a few words in our policy is not going to um, materially, I don't gather, motivate the state to change its formulas for the resources they provide. Um, am, am I making sense or, or am I jumping around too much? I don't want to just throw some words in, into our policy if the state isn't changing their formula to actually implement Leandro. Couldn't we easily as be uh, just as easily be sued for uh, adopting Leandro here, but not having the resources uh, as as the other scenario that you talked about? It sounds um, like I'm making this stuff up or something, but um, I, I don't I don't understand the actual ramifications, and it's more than just words on a, a page here. We're adopting some case that's not completely resolved or hasn't worked its way through the legal process, much less the legislative implementation of those final decisions. Let me just, and I, I think Mr. Powell wanted to say something too, but the, the, the Leandro decision that's cited here, Leandro v. State, the 1997 decision, is a, the final and current decision from the North Carolina uh, Supreme Court that says all students are entitled to that sound basic education. So when I said there's continued litigation, there is a lot of fighting over what that really means. In other words, I've read you the definition, but does that mean pre-K? Does that mean a certain level of funding? Does it mean a certain level of programs? There certainly is, and is likely to continue to be litigation over exactly how that gets defined. But I don't think there's any dispute about the, the broad definition that I've read about what a sound basic education means. I think the issue, the, again, and it's up to the board. The reason this was added in this, in this um, proposed policy is to say that providing this basic education, the fundamental knowledge, 
is something the board considers a significant duty and, and would be a guiding principle if you're discussing how to allocate funds or budget, you might look to are we doing what we need to do to provide, you know, that fundamental knowledge of English and mathematics that, that I referenced. I, I think that, that part's optional. You can decide whether this is a governing duty. You probably have to provide a sound basic education, whether it's in the policy or not, to your point. And again, we're fortunate, and we <laughs> never, no one's ever sued claiming we're not. I think we do a, a good job as a system providing a sound basic education to our students. It's really, do you want to reference it and make it one of the board's duties by policy or not? And that's really up to the board. So you, I, I don't think much changes whether you adopt it or not. And the, to your point, this doesn't create funding. The state's not going to say, oh, well, Tavares adopted this. We're going to give you more money. It's really, uh, do you want this to be part of kind of your rubric, just like these other points in Policy 1010 that are already there in terms of, you know, um, is it one of those things to consider? Not really up to the board. Mark, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, the state sends this to us as a required PLS update. Are we allowed not to uh, adopt a required PLS update? I, um, I've looked at that. I do, I'm not clear why they're claiming that it actually has to be required. I think the, uh, we're required to follow Leandro, and that's probably what the lawyers that are drafting this are saying. Mm -hmm. Since Leandro is the law of the Supreme Court, you have to follow it. I actually disagree with their, to the extent they're saying it's required that we adopt it in this policy, I, I disagree with the guidance from the <clears throat> policies to leave the school folks. I don't think we're required to do it. There's no law that makes us record. <coughs> I would tell you as your attorney, you're required to follow Leandro. You are required to provide a sound basic education, and in that sense it's required. But you don't have to put it in policy as far as I can tell. So <clears throat> that's one where I respectfully disagree with kind of the suggestion from the from the policies to leave the school folks. <laughs> I was only going to say that whether we put in the policy or not, we're still bound to follow the Leandro case, uh, provide that education as defined in that Leandro case. So whether we change it or not, we're still bound to that standard created in that case. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct, Mr. Powell. Thank you. Uh, any more comments on this? So we're going to put this on the consent or on the action? Consent? Okay. That carries us to 4.02. And we have several policies on that one. Are there any comments on any of the any specific policies? I didn't see anyone send anything else out. So should we put all those on consent agenda? Yes? Okay. So those will be going to the consent agenda. All right. Now we go to 5.01, which are the budget amendments. Ms. Klutz is coming up to the front. <coughs> there were some questions about this, so uh, I believe some information was sent out today, and Ms. Klutz is prepared to also enlighten us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, I think, three budget amendments before you today. The first one being state, and um, I always like to hit the big money amounts because those are usually the ones you're most concerned about. Um, the, uh, the, the first uh, large one is the reduction in the fuel adjustment from the state, and that one was the one that had, we had the question about. Um, I knew that that would be, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, but um, so the reason what happens with that is that the, the state has adjusted our fuel adjustment <clears throat> for the fuel rates. And so they adjusted it from the original allocation of $2.33 <coughs> a gallon down to $1.79 per gallon. So at the beginning of the year, excuse me, <clears throat> at the beginning of the year, um, they allocated our budget at that two thirty three dollars per gallon. Since then, you know, Fuel prices have continued to, to um, lower, and so they've adjusted that. Um, that's a $391,000 adjustment for us in Cabarrus County, and so you can tell our fuel budget is significant. There are two transportation um, funding sources that I mentioned before. One is state and one is local. Um, it is more uh, advantageous for us to allocate and uh, budget all of the state dollars in salaries. Um, because with that, you get the benefits of the state paying the 
the benefits, um, the pay increases, the workers' comp that's associated that. So that's one of those little efficiency tricks that we use to put everything in the state that we can, and then that frees up our local money to do more with that. So we budget our fuel in the local budget. So when the state um, adjust, makes a fuel adjustment, I have to lower the state budget, and there's no fuel in the state budget, so I have to lower the salaries, and then I increase the salaries in the local side, and those net to zero, and then on the local side, I decrease the fuel budget. Okay, so it's just we're, we're making the reduction into local instead of state. Okay, so it's just moving, moving that around. Okay, um, the other really large one that you're seeing there are the, the bonuses <clears throat> that the state allocated. Um, that's a guaranteed allotment, and they, I don't usually do those until the end of the fiscal year, but because there, that was so much money, it's making my books look off, um, so it bothered me, so I'm bringing it to you now rather than waiting until June to do that. Okay. We'll go to local if there are no other questions. Um, you're seeing the local. Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, you're seeing, thank you. Um, you're seeing on the local, we can go back one. That's the opposite side of that transportation adjustment that I just um, explained. And then we'll go to the local special. Now, the first entry here is the Ingersoll Rand Grand. <laughs> Ingersoll Rand Grant, um, <laughs> say that fast, can't do it, um, <laughs> awarded to J.M. Robinson for the purchase of equipment and associated furniture and supplies uh, for their automotive class. And then you'll see um, another award that we talked about just a little bit earlier to Wolf Meadow for their intercession camps. And... We failed to put the name up there, so I'm going to tell you it's from Gene Haas Foundation um, for that grant. And then the final one <clears throat> is um, to record the revenue that's generated, the Medicaid revenue. Um, and so, you know, a while ago we've talked with you about using um, PCG rather than Fairbanks as our provider to get our Medicaid. And so we are coming in at higher revenues with that provider, um, so those are should be in booked and allocated there. Higher costs or higher higher uh, revenue, so that's revenue more money. Us. It's it's a reimbursement of expense that we um, apply for on the EC side. So that was one that was the biggest reason that we changed providers is because they said that our revenue would increase, and we're seeing that it has increased. And when we did um, a grant such as the one from Ingersoll Rand, mm -hmm. is there a formal process of thanking? I, mean, I, I don't recall that the board had ever done a, a resolution saying thank you, Ingersoll Rand, for giving us this grant. But I'm assuming the superintendent or someone else does. Oftentimes, we will um, send a letter from the superintendent signed by the superintendent thanking the company or the organization for a grant, particularly of um, that size and, and that nature. And there's usually some sort of like grant presentation mm -hmm. so that we have an opportunity for photos and handshaking and, and thanking in person as well. I'm not sure if that'll be the case with this particular grant or not. I think it'd be right neighborly of us to do that but also with the Jimmy Johnson Foundation and other foundations that have been so generous to the system. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. And so the final budget amendments are federal um, budget amendments, and, and they are at this point um, doing their, their adjustments from their planning allotment to their actual allotments. It takes um, the federal uh, grants and, and budgets a little while to catch up. So you're seeing that there was um, an increase in the EC dollars, the IDEA EC dollars um, versus what we were planned for. So that's certainly 
good and we need those dollars. And then the, the last one is just a minor adjustment where we were reflecting, um, still adjusting for those bonuses. We're chasing those all the time. Um, and that's all we have. If you have any questions, I'll address them. Are there any more questions for this? Uh, consent agenda? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Klutz. Thank you. And then that carries us to you next on the audit contract. Yes, sir. Um, attached on your screen, you'll see the proposed audit contract with um, our current auditors, Anderson, Smith, and White. Um, they uh, are doing uh, the audit this year for the same amount that they've done it for last year and I believe uh, the previous year. Um, and so this is a, an LGC contract, an LGC drafty contract. It's standard. Um, certainly Mark has reviewed it many times, but um, I don't think I actually sent it to you this time, but it is a standard contract um, uh, issued by the LGC. And he's, he's looking over it now, and he'll tell you, I'm sure, if he has any concerns with it. It's, it's the same, standard, same form we see in always. The it's, not, yeah, it's not one of our forms. Mm -hmm. It's not really a negotiable form. It's a good form, though. I mean, the LGC's drafted in a way that I think is favorable to us. So I'm, 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 I apologize for not sending it up. No worries. Any comments on this? This is the third year. Four, uh, no, I believe it's the fifth, actually. But you said the third year that it's been the exact same price. Well, you know what? I didn't go back and look at that history. Honestly, I, just recalling from memory seems to me like that's been the, the price from the beginning. From the I, don't, beginning. I don't believe that they've increased it. Okay. Is there a practice where you don't have the same auditor for more than a certain amount of years? So there's a lot of, uh, there's some things that they do um, as a CPA in general. So there's, you know, obviously our ethics that we all uphold and, and take our, our classes and adhere to when we renew our certificate. Um, there's also um, peer reviews that they do. And so another CPA re review firm comes in and, and does their reviews. In addition, they... Um, switch managers in charge. Um, they alternate those every two years so that we have a new set, different set of eyes. Um, so, and this is a this is a service. Um, you know, I, I think of it similar to our legal service that's provided. Um. Well, we have been kind of putting it out about every. I mean, so we had our previous auditor for over ten years. Um, and then the board asked me to send it out for RFP. I think there was a concern with price. Um, so we put it out for RFP and uh, we've gotten these, the same auditors. We were always, um, had a, a clean opinion and great audits with our previous auditors. Um, we have clean opinions and great audits with these auditors. Um, I. I'll leave it at that. Well, I mean, it's, it's, with, with, I mean, and I probably was the one that said that. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's good to sometimes get a, you know, put it out and just, just to double check. But I mean, I think we should go ahead maybe with this one, but after this one, maybe to go out next year. Maybe so I reached out to the board um, about two weeks ago and I said, I know that there's a concern, there has been a concern in the past, and if you would like for me to go out for an RFP, I would like for you to tell me now before I bring that to the board. Well, I mean, go ahead and do this one, but maybe next year to do it. But I mean, I'm, I'm willing to go ahead with this one, but maybe next year to do it. That, 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 that strikes me as about right every five years. About, e about every it's five, just, yeah. Just to give another firm the opportunity. Opportunity, yeah. I mean, we are a public agency, and we ought to not be locked into just one company. But I'd say let's put on consent. All right, consent. Mm -hmm. All right. Five dot zero three, uh, class size waiver for Pitt School Road Elementary. Dr. Van Heuchelum. And Miss Beard. Hey. Dr. Beard. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the board. Um, 
This is a, a request for a class size waiver for Pitt School Road Elementary School. Um, as you know, we have a state law that says all kindergarten through third grade classrooms must be under 24 students. Each individual class must be under 24 students. Um, there are cases, though, and we have a rare occasion at a school where there's a, an influx at a particular grade level. In other words, all the new students that show up at the door don't come across the K-5 spectrum. They come at one grade level, and that's what we have here at Pitt School Road. We have a, had an increase of students. Um, they're not coming in the right grades, so they're coming all at second grade, and so we have two kids um, in the second grade at Pitt School Road that have put us over that 1 to 24 ratio in second grade only. Um, and so that leaves us with a couple options. Um, one option is to do what we call a, a, a combo class, where we reorganize the students across grade levels. You could also call it a multi-age classroom. And in this scenario, what Marcy would have to do is take some first graders off the top of the first grade classrooms and some second graders off the top of the second grade classrooms, put them in a one-two combination class and dissolve an entire class of students and sprinkle those students across the other remaining classes. Um, we've done that in the past. We have several combo classes in our district right now. They, they, they run fine and our kids learn in those environments. But it does disrupt the students. It disrupts the families, the, the connection that the students have had to the teacher. Uh, we're going to send a letter to you as a parent and say, we're going to move your child's teacher from Miss so-and-so to Miss so-and-so. We hate to do that, but we have to do it to comply with the law. As Marcy kind of looked at uh, that situation, talked with her team, um, her team and Marcy really kind of felt like they would rather just ask for a waiver and add one extra student into two of those classrooms. And so we now have two teachers at Pitt School Road Elementary School who have 25 kids in their class, not 24 kids in their class. We're supporting those classrooms with um, TAs, the uh, extra t teacher assistants that we have from uh, several months ago. So during reading and math time in particular, they have dedicated support um, to facilitate small group instruction. So it's not one teacher with 25 kids, it's one teacher with 25 kids and a teacher assistant to facilitate those, those small groups. So in order to do that, we do need board approval. Um, I've already talked to the State Department and they understand this is on the agenda tonight and um, so uh, this is a formality of sorts. We've done this one time in the past. We did this at Culture and Web, I believe, two years ago. We don't usually have to do it, but, but this is a situation where we are. We'd like to ask that. One question. All right, if we have to do it this year, <clears throat> we'd have to do it again next year because won't those little first graders go to second grader and, uh, I mean, at the same school? Yeah, Marcy will know that, and she'll <laughs> make sure at the beginning of the year um, she'll have more, she'll allocate another teacher there and decrease in another area. Thank you. Any other, com any other comments? Consent. Consent? Let's go. All right. Thank you, Dr. Beard, for coming out for that quick. All right, Royal Oaks Elementary Site Work, Mr. Louder. As you're aware, we are starting the uh, Royal Oaks project. We have a very limited uh, time frame to do that. Uh, we, we bid the project um, to have us uh, to be able to award just the site work portion ahead of the building portion. And in doing so, uh, if they had the funding available, could allow us then to award that portion of the contract and start early to do off site site work, which is the new bus entrance, demolition of some structures we've already purchased, and that sort of thing to get a couple of months ahead start on the actual construction of the building because they won't vacate it till like June 7th or June 8th. Uh, it, it, what you see attached to your agenda item is a letter that I wrote to Cabarrus County because they needed that last week in order to make their agenda. But, uh, and they did pass, or they did talk about and put on their consent agenda tonight at their meeting, uh, a resolution for reimbursement from bond funds to allow them to do, to be able to uh, reimburse themselves by putting the money up front and then once the bonds are sold, reimburse themselves for that. So this is just formalizing that request from you uh, to, the, to them to ask them to request that $2.19 million. Any questions on this for, Dr. for Mr. Louder? Consent? 
All right. Mr. Louder, that takes you to the 10-year plan. And that's what takes me to the uh, oh. HVAC, I believe. HVAC, yep, I have a page. All right. <clears throat> yes. As you're aware, uh, we we have a chiller replacement project at Concord Middle School where we had it uh, at one time to uh, completely replace it, but uh, we didn't have the funding to do that. But uh, unfortunately, and, and, and I think some of you had some questions about the study that said this you know, chiller should last until 2019. Unfortunately, we did have some mechanical failures within that unit, therefore we need to go ahead and replace it. So what we have done is uh, go in and find out exactly the components we could replace right now and, and look for the budget monies to do so. We've actually had to rebid it and restructure it a couple times just to try to get within a budget money we could, we could you know, scrape up enough money to do so. We actually even used the Department of, Insurance, uh, Department of Instruction to come down and certify our actual um, bid document so that therefore he was, you know, he was comfortable with what equipment we were purchasing without having to hire a separate engineering contract to do so, uh, thus allowing us to reduce the budget even further. But uh, this is the, uh, we had, we received bids and, and obviously uh, I think the bid tab is uh, attached for you, but uh, JCI York was our lowest uh, bidder. And at that point in time, we were just asking that we, you know, it, because it is over $300,000, it does need a board approval for us to be able to award that contract. Any questions for Mr. Louder? I think someone had some concern about the age of the bid tabulation. Will they still honor the price that's on there, even though the bid tabulation was Octoberish? Yes, sir. We, we made sure that once we took our bids, that they would be, you know, good for a period of time, and they have honored that. All right. Consent? And where are we oh. going to get the money from? Oh, it was. Money by <laughs> Ke Kelly's money tree. <laughs> money tree. I know she's not going to let go of it. <laughs> So this was a capital project that we asked that went through the budget committee and we asked the county for last year and they were able to fund that. So it was a it was a really large project and there was two phases of it that we were able to to break it into. So we're able to do the first phase and this is what he's talking about. We were, were not able to do it. So about a million more that they weren't able to fund, but we can get this part. But it it was uh, approved by the county for this fiscal year. So it was, so we've got mm -hmm. this million. Yes, ma'am, we do. Oh, okay. Consent. <laughs> consent? All right. So it's consent after all. You see? Now I'm still waiting for you to talk about the 10 year plan. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Super Bowl Monday. <laughs> uh, Yes, at this point in time, uh, I, I don't know that uh, y'all wish for me to go over the 10-year plan. Again, I'm here to basically answer any questions you may have or any clarifications you may have had because I think we went through it pretty thoroughly here at our work I session just recently. Well, I, uh, I, 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 I do too, Ms. Carpenter. Mr. Walton, <laughs> I think this is the first time it's tele televised for the public. I think we ought to go through it again. Go What, the, what are the wishes of the remainder of the board? Is the, is the plan on board docs, is it available? Yes, sir. To, for everybody to just download and look at it at yes, their sir. leisure? Mr. Walter, is that not appropriate? No, it's an option, but I, I think I'd prefer that the, at least go over this is a big dollar amount. It was in the paper. They did a big yeah, article in the, the paper, a huge it. article in the paper, and went over it in the paper. Okay. Are there some specific comments? Uh, I don't see that, uh, that there's interest in doing through the whole plan, but I'm sure that there are tidbits in the plan that we might want to see added or adjusted. So, Dr. Phillips, you have something that you want to say? Right. So, at the... Um Commissioner's retreat on, on Friday, you, uh, you you presented these uh, timelines, which yes. were not um, available previous to that. And uh, after looking through them, the, one, the the only thing that I'm uh, a little bit concerned about is that the is the sequencing of the uh, new middle school. Uh, sorry, new elementary school for the. Uh, um, what, what area? Southwest, so the Harrisburg area, 
that would not actually open until uh, it looks like um, August 2021. Can we really wait that long for a new elementary school in that area? Well, uh, from the time, obviously, uh, we will have to obviously do some additional uh, rearranging or, or some capping of the schools or whatever. But we have talked to, look, uh, to the county about, you know, opportunities for us to resequence those as their funding would be made available. They have asked us for our three highest priorities, and those highest, pri highest priorities are the high school, middle school, and the elementary school. And uh, with doing that, that would move that one forward. Mm -hmm. What we were doing originally was space that way. Originally on that timeline is because we were trying to space out the dollars based on the, the, the actual amounts of those dollars. Plus, also, we would call on the replacement slash um, uh, swing school. We pretty much had to have one school ahead of the other or else that swing system doesn't work. And that's why it kind of moved ahead a little bit of the Mount by the, the Harrisburg School. Right. No, I, I appreciated <clears throat> that that's, that's why you did that, because you were trying to get the... Um, the two uh, new schools in the downtown Concord area built in the first five years. But it, just seeing this, it almost seems like we need to do the Harrisburg one first and then come in and start the two downtown Concord schools because they're not bursting at the seams like the Harrisburg schools. But uh, and I would just say that um, I, I think what Mr. Lauer was saying is the conversation we had then was to try to get them our needs and kind of a sequence and then they want to be able to process that and things like property were a big part of that so for example this doesn't mean any of this is right but if they had three million dollars surplus now they may go ahead and buy property for an elementary school or a high school or a middle school and so all that becomes part of their equation so I feel like in the next couple weeks them being able to process that may determine that because I don't think anybody here disagrees with what you're saying there's definitely going to be a need for that it all depends on the three elementary schools that serve that area, can mobile units be used effectively there? And then are they gonna buy property tomorrow or are they gonna pro buy property two years from now? And then that will kind of drive that discussion. So I think you're right. I just think there's, we're kind of in this, we presented to them and we haven't really heard back and let them digest that. And there will be some tweaking based on that, if that makes sense. Well, as long as we can consider the plan to just be what's in this binder minus the sequence of the timelines, then I, I'm ready to, to support the plan. And, um, but I, I think we need to take a closer look at the sequencing to um, uh, try to get that Harrisburg Elementary School, or it's not Harrisburg Elementary School, but a new elementary school in the Harrisburg area uh, open sooner than 2021. And with the timeline, we did not include that as part of the 10-year plan because that's basically a financial tool for, for the county just to be able to look at it from their standpoint is how, how, when would the money need to come based on each project? Those projects can shift anywhere within that five-year period. They just need to know in what sequence we would require a certain amount of money for each project we presented. And that's what that was for, which is more for financial purposes, not necessarily a 10-year plan. Um. I do have a question. Um, one of the, in some of your charts, um, obviously we made a couple. We made a decision to uh, move our magnet program from Patriots, the STEM magnet, to from Patriots over to um, R. Brown, McAllister, and Beverly Hills. Could y'all update your your matrices with the program capacities and reflect those population numbers so that this presentation reflects the latest board action. I think that that would help us get a, a clearer picture of what we are dealing with downtown because we did add uh, 200 and some students to the those two schools downtown and move some out of Patriots so that helps show that there is a little bit of relief in the works for Patriots. Um, another uh, observation and uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Walter also said something to me about it today is that last year there was a matrix that uh, showed how many, uh, the program capacity for each of the schools. It also showed the number, the max number of mobile units that could be um, put at each one of the schools. And I was wondering if it would be too difficult to update that matrix and put that as an appendix, appendices to this plan so that we would have that to refer to later on. You don't have to extrapolate it out just due today, but it would be nice to keep that 
uh, updated because a lot of work was done on that last year, and I think it, it's a valuable tool going forward. We have a spreadsheet that basically uh, shows every mobile where every mobile unit is and uh, what every mobile unit is allowed at each uh, school, and that has been updated every time we move a mobile unit. It changes, and that's yeah. an updated spreadsheet. Just a matter of just attaching it. Yeah, with this one, uh, Miss Reimer, I believe you. Well, Dr. Phillips has the the. So if you would just, I think if you just update it, kind of encapsulates all the. Was given at the retreat last year. Okay. Yeah. That. It's kind of a one-stop shop. So the the data, I mean, the, the the form's already there. It's just a matter of plugging in a couple of a few of the numbers. It's not a, you don't have to reinvent anything. Yeah, the idea of making that an appendix, like he said, I think is the way to go with that. We we got last year we got into a lot of program where we had six different capacities that were listed and confused everybody. I don't think we want to go back there, but I do think we can, like they said, they have an up, a spreadsheet that can just make that part of the appendix and that it's always available and then we won't get people confused on that area, but the information's there. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, last year we had even the, the inventory of developments um, that were out there. I don't think we need that, but, but I do believe you should put the date that you, that these numbers are valid from so, you know, when we were talking to the commissioners at the retreat, we said the data was valid up to a certain point. We should say that this 10-year study is based on what we knew as of this date because I know Kanapas is looking at some rezoning already and Harrisburg's probably got some and Concord as well. And those are going to be popping on top of the estimates that we've already given them. So they're going to blow us out of the water with more information than what we have available to us. I have already been asked by a couple of municipalities how much did I put in there for them to grow. Uh, I said I did not. <laughs> right. That's right. Our, our study doesn't allow for any other growth other than a five-year build-out. But that's why I say let's put a date so that we know as of this date these were what, was, what were approved and then we can always do the arithmetic next year when we update this plan and we'll go from that date on. It should be helpful. Any, any other comments about the 10-year plan, that you, any information that you want uh, added to it that uh, would uh, help you in supporting it next week? Mr. Walter? Again, referring to kind of last year, we had these program capacities, and I'm sorry to keep harping on the program capacities, but they vary uh, significantly at some schools. Like in Bethel, you, you know, last year we presented a program capacity of 1,065 students, and this year we're presented with a program capacity of 941. Yet that's apparently one of our highest growth area. So what's the big change in that in that particular? Why so why do, why do we reduce the seats when we actually apparently think we're going to need the seats? Um, and there are a couple of them like that. I was just trying to get my wrap my mind around that. Uh, I, I, it, it boils down to basically uh, when you have the rooms available, then you can actually modify the programs within your school to be able to fill that space. And that's what they basically have to do. And that's really kind of somewhat up to the principals and, of course, with the elementary school assistant principals and that sort of thing to decide what type of programs go to each school. So we may look at a school that has capacity, and then we would change the program there to allow us to be able to use those very low-use uh, type uh, programs because we have capacity, and that's why we do that. Uh, where we do not have capacity, of course, we obviously would not try to change programs to reduce the number of students there. So that's, that's pretty much Let me give you two examples I think may help clarify, because like you said, you can get caught up in this. So when we have a self-contained program, and we keep using the autistic program as an example, Ms. Reimer and I were talking about this today to, to make sure we could explain this. So first year that Central Cabarrus has an autistic program was when Ms. Reimer was the principal. So they open up and they have four autistic students in that program. That takes one classroom. The next year, four more or five students come up in a, in a ninth grade class because it pulls from four different high schools. And now they need two classrooms to run that autistic program solely based on how many students that are high school age are in the autistic program at high school. So now we just lost 25 student capacity and therefore that changed. So I think Dr. Van Heuchelen said last week we had three or four new classes this, this year based on just the needs. Students may move in. Um, my daughter, both of my daughters went to Weddington Hills, which also had an autistic program. And I know for a fact there, was, there were people that move in from all kinds of counties around us to get into that program. And so, because it, it was such a strong program, so if seven families move from Mecklenburg and Iredale and somewhere else because they know of, of that network, then they just lost some capacity. And so that happens every year. Um, it happens with the building. And so that's one example that changes it all the time. The second one, I think, is in a school like Bethel, 
um, they have lots of space. You know, they have essentially a half-empty building. So maybe the speech teacher uses a classroom. And um, when we really get down to whether we're going to let them do that or not, we may say, you know what, we're going to put students in that classroom and we're going to have to float that speech teacher in. But when we have the luxury of space, we're using that classroom every day. We're serving five or six kids for speech. When we don't have that luxury anymore, then we're going to bump them out, figure another way to do that. But it kind of changes capacity, and that's why that number is always moving a little bit and a little bit confusing. Um, and so we tried it. Ms. Reimer and, and Mr. Louder and Mr. Burnett have been working on that all the time to say, well, let's go walk the building again and try to get as close as we can because, but, but again, that could change if you know, Pitt School Road, a bunch of second graders came in. Well, if those second graders all need speech and and happen to be, you know, have a disability, then it may change the capacity. And so it's kind of this evolving number that can drive you a little bit crazy, but, but, but I think those are two, two ways to explain that. Okay, so when we say we're at 110% capacity, we may or may not be based on a couple percentage based on it being added, added and lowered. Um, or maybe for that year, you know, like Boger, for example, has numerous um, self-contained programs that we're gonna move to different schools. I think we talked about Odell because we know that we have students coming over for Royal Oaks, therefore we're gonna move that program out. That'll lower the Odell capacity, raise the Boger one, and again, that's kinda of right. how you do that all the time based on the need and, and what students show up. So when I see it, exactly, so when I see this presentation and it says 141% capacity we're, we're looking at at Boger, uh, that raises a lot of flags, yet if you look at the capacity, I mean, last year it was 955, this year it's 861 so you, what you're saying you can raise that back up again so that 141 won't be as high i mean granted this is all crystal ball stuff anyway so it's good it, it's really not a, a, a specific they're, they're number be but way over capacity they're going to have a lot of mobile units there but if we move in up you know again the autistic program from boger to weinkoff bogers goes down weinkoff goes up if we move it from weinkoff to and so those self-contained programs use more space than a regular classroom and depending on how many students show up and where we house it, it will change capacity. And for, for me, I'm, you know, again, what is our priority? You kind of look at which ones are going to be the highest over capacity. But then if we can modify the capacity, it may not be the highest over capacity. So that's where I'm wrestling on some of the, the numbers. Um, and again, it's an ongoing, um, sometimes one year's worth of students. You know, your, your building's close to capacity and you get a lot of students with a disability and think, wow, now we're at capacity in one year and we didn't expect that. Well, that was the second graders that showed up at Pitt School, that type of thing. So. And then my other question is, last year there was a recommendation that you could actually save money by using a campus concept, a middle school and a high school on the same campus. Did you look into that or, or not? Or, we look at it from a standpoint of the new high school going in a uh, an alternative location in the western part of the county uh, by having a, a campus style where we could maybe put the middle school and high school on the same campus. Uh, our biggest problem is trying to find 150 to 160 acres in one track to allow us to do so. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to do. Uh, matter of fact, we are very limited on about the 100 acre tracks we can find for high schools right now and trying to put 150 is getting a little, especially in the western part of the county where the growth areas are. So we would, yeah, it would be great to have both of them on the same campus or both of them next to each other. However, it's just it's going to be limited on what, what property we as a county can, can actually acquire. But we're saying we're still open to that concept? Oh, absolutely open to the concept. It's just a matter of you know, who can, it, it depends on the right piece of property that comes in and lets us acquire that piece of property. I mean, obviously we're on the outlook, you know, look out for any types of properties that would allow us to do that. Uh, but I say we're not going to X out properties because it's said, hey, I can't get two schools in that piece of property, so I'm not going to look at that one. You know, in our case, we say, hey, look, that property is available and it's going to house one of our types of schools we need, then we're probably going to go look and try to get that piece of property. Uh, but just because it won't fit two or three schools on it doesn't mean we'll just kind of throw it off the shelf and say that's not what I'm looking at. Okay, so the central area well, central area high school, that would not be a campus. So you don't think there's enough If you're recalling the central area high school uh, plan, we already have one uh, middle school very close to where mm -hmm. that location would be, and we were looking to build another middle school to help realignment there to allow us to shift alignment from the existing middle school to that school because it's very close to where we want to build the centralized high school and then add another middle school that would better align with uh, the, you know, one of the district areas that we would pull in from. So in that case, it probably wouldn't work out as well because that would mean I have too many middle schools very, very close together if I did that. Okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, one, one of the things that, and I, I mentioned it to you, and, and two, we, we already found it when we were doing Odell, 
Um, and when you were talking about the swing still school and the elementary school that you were building, you put an amount, uh, a number of 650. And my thing was that if we were building those and we were saying we were going to have our STEM program, you know, we're always saying we have a waiting list and usually it's 200 or more on our waiting list. I really would like to see us even up that at least 100 maybe 150 on on both of those because if we're going to have those as stem programs that can alleviate you're saying well gee our population's not that big on either one of those schools but if we're wanting to alleviate and bring in from other areas that are for the stem program we can fill it up and it, we all know it's less expensive to do it when you're building it. We found that in the case with Odell. When you're building it, it's a lot less expensive than if you're having to build afterwards. Because we found that case when, with Carl Fur, with Boger, when we had to go afterwards and build afterwards, it was a lot more expensive. So hopefully we will consider that. I, I know that maybe our superintendent don't like them that big but <laughs> I, I hope we will consider that uh, when the time comes we know that is further down that's not our first priorities but I hope we will consider that considering those will be magnet schools um, and we can build it they will come uh, the old saying uh, especially when it comes to the magnet we've seen that happen we know we've got waiting lists and if we do that, we maybe can get them from those schools that are overcrowded, the, the Odell's, the, the Pitt School, the, the other ones, and we can, we can, we can fill them up. Uh, we, we, we more definitely look at the largest school we can build on that campus. Obviously, we build a whole new site for one of the replacement schools that may allow us to build a bigger school because we have more land to do so. Culturally, we may be a little limited on that site because it is a smaller site in an urban situation, so we may have to be a little limited on what we can put back there because of the site conditions. But we, we will, obviously, when we get into the programming portion of that and the design portion, if we can maximize it, we will certainly do so. When I look at the 10-year plan, which I think is very impressive, and I support it, Nonetheless, I feel like I'm playing three-dimensional chess because y'all have done a marvelous job of intricately putting all these pieces in here um, together. But in some of the answers and replies and the interviewing processes we've had over the last few weeks, I get the impression that we uh, suggestions would throw some items in this plan out of kilter or uh, it would um, I guess I'm trying to say is this plan becoming so intricate that we are locking ourselves into a very uh, uh, tight uh, sequence of activities and, and projects or do we have enough flexibility in here for unexpected um, circumstances that may arise um, the point of a plan to me is to have a plan and to follow through with that plan and, and adhere to that plan for the foreseeable future. Um, and I kind of don't want to be in a position for major issues. I'm talking about big things. Part of the way through to three years into the plan, which may be obligating now some other board in the future um, to, to find ourselves saying, whoops, we need to make um, major adjustments to this plan. How, how are we planning to be flexible within this, the scope of this um, outline as it is. Well, we feel like this plan has to be fluid for sure. One, you know, we do know what our priorities are right now. And we know that three years from now we can have our best estimate of what grade levels and what type of schools we're going to have to have in place. Okay. Now, beyond that three years, it could be very, it could change drastically depending on the growth patterns within the county, because of the economic conditions in the county, depending on whether they can fund it on the county, which may or may not allow us to build it at sequence which we wish to have. Obviously, our preference, and the best day, you know, what we have today, we give it our best options of this is our sequencing, and this is our priority. However, that can change drastically over the next three and even five, and as you get out six and seven years, it even change even more because you cannot have that crystal ball to be able to determine exactly what you're going to need. But we, do, we have identified, though, based on our population, that we're going to need high school, 
a middle school, an elementary school, and then we're gonna have to do some replacement situations. We're gonna have to replace the high school. We know that's gonna have to come, whether it comes first, last, or four years from now. And then just beyond that, with this still within that same time year frame, time frame, we know we're gonna have probably have another high school and a middle school, elementary school to tie in with those in that six to ten year side. So we know that we don't know where it'll be, but we do know that we're gonna have to have based just on population and student population. We have to have that. And I think we've had <coughs> discussions with the county commissioners to the effect that at least the idea of land banking would be would put some teeth in this plan and and it would st stabilize so many questions that otherwise could be very fluid and very um unpredictable in the future um, my experience is that a plan um will become um the gospel to municipalities but without something really, really very tangible and, and, and uh, uh, making things an actual done deal, such as land banking, um, some elements of a plan, maybe not this, would be more difficult to actually implement and actually uh, put into place. Further, that we would um, be giving neighborhoods and families and businesses uh, a six months notice about decisions we had to make as opposed to a two or three or four year uh, timeline of, um, of how they could make their own plans in the, again their neighborhoods and and uh, business or commercial um, activity so I'm just saying I hope that as we work out all the details political and whatnot that we can um, get some commitments to um, for example to bank land that will be designated and earmarked for future use for schools so that this plan itself would be extremely reliable and stable um, and not just and, and actually be able to be implemented fully. We feel like that, you know in our conversations with the staff at the county and, and also with, with the county commission they feel like that is one of our highest priorities is to go ahead and start land banking. Once we have land banking then we can determine exactly where the schools are going to go and can kind of give people some very distinct plans that this school will go here. And. Uh, Right now, with not having land available or having land in our books, uh, can't really do that. But uh, we can get pretty, we know the general area, and we've tried to be general as we can, but yet still be somewhat specific in what areas we have to be able to, to provide relief for. And, uh, but the county is very supportive of that. We've had major conversations. Again, uh, based on our conversation, they would like to see us look at buying land and doing design work with cash and then only borrowing the money necessary to actually build the building. Mm -hmm. And then on the back end, using cash to furnish it and technology and that sort of thing. So that's a, that's a good plan because that way you are not borrowing money for things that are you know, somewhat fluid like you know, furniture and technology. All right, board members. This an action agenda item for next week? Okay. Tim. All right, that takes us to 5.08, which is the resolution in support of the Connect NC Bond Act. Um, you will see before you on board docs is a, nope, wrong one. We're doing the 5.08, the resolution for the Connect Bond. And board members, basically what we're asking is, do you want to do a resolution in support of the Connect Bond, which would impact RCCC to the tune of $7.2 million. Um, it's about $9.6 million to CPCC and $90 million to UNCC. So it would bring significant money into this locale as far as our colleges of higher learning. It has no direct impact on our system. Would you all like to have a resolution that looks similar to this? Yeah, I, I, I thought you'd send out a draft, but uh, this is not what you had. 
text for quite a while, yeah. but it was an attachment. And it, it's, it's essentially the same, or materially the same. Well, David, can you send out the draft that you sent out? Yeah, I'll, I'll find my email to you. Okay. Because I thought, I thought that's what we would put up here. Yeah. Long story short, we were speaking with um, um, RCC um, uh, staff at an event a few months ago, and saw an opportunity to, to uh, Ms. Carpenter and I were speaking with those folks, and saw an opportunity to um, kind of extend our educational partnership, I guess is the way I'm trying to put it. Um, to, Rowan was going to do it too. I thought we were going to kind of do it. Yeah. Um, well, Rowan has declined to do yeah. this, but K, K, uh, Kannapolis City Schools has done a resolution in support of it. I'll find my email. I actually have it right here. I'm going to go ahead and forward this to all of you and I'll forward it to Aileen as well. It's it's probably much the same language, boilerplate kind of language. But it seemed like a very good opportunity for us to show our support for the community college system um, on this statewide initiative coming up on in March 15th. Acknowledges our partnership with uh, Rowan Traverse Community College on what will now be two early college <coughs> programs. Write me up some text, Mr. Uh, Dr. Phillips, and, and, and we, might, we, we might we might we might we might shoehorn it in there somewhere for you. Just happily, happily. Well, the email is in your inbox at this very moment. So, Mr. Mr. Will. Mr. Harrison has written up so. So with that in mind, does it, so it does have an impact on us or it does not have an impact with the early college? Does, it, that, get, does that free up space where they can keep expand that it, program? It, or is that as I recall, it did not have any kind of direct impact on us. It was just a partnership kind of effort on our part to uh, support their desire for uh, state uh, bond money in order but to expand their facilities. Some of the pressure off of our local economy, that's $7.2 million that Cabarrus County doesn't have to come up with for facilities for RCC. And which allows the county some flexibility. Yeah. No, that could have an indirect impact. It has, a direct, it has some type of an impact on, on more support of that, otherwise it's more uh, individual preference. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, like I said, it's an indirect impact, and like a, you know, the 7.2 million means that the county commissioners don't have to come up with that. And as you remember, um, in the 2014 election, there was a bond for a bond vote for their uh, manufacturing center, and I think it was for nine million or something. But uh, you know, but they're competing with with us for. I hate to say the word competing, but you know, we're all looking at the same pot and asking for something to happen. So this would at least allow them to do some other projects that they can't normally do. All right. Well, it, it's in your inbox. If you have any more comments, just send them to me and uh, Mr. Harrison. I'll get to, to Aileen this week so that she will have the uh, the draft that we'll look at on Monday along with any uh, amendments that may be offered. Thank you. All right, so that will be an action agenda item. And now that takes us to the Board of Education legislative agenda. Um, if you will remember, it was a not this past week, but the week before I sent out uh, the legislative agenda in a very rough draft, and I had draft all over it so that people would know it was draft. Um, uh, Mr. Harrison has endeavored to uh, craft this document. He's taken Dr. Phillips's feedback on the grading that uh, was on our 2015 agenda, um, and he provided some grades. I don't know if any of you all had a chance to look at that, and uh, this is an opportunity for us now to talk about is this the form that we want or do we want to do something different do we want to put a grade do we just want to have a 2016 legislative agenda i believe that we need to have some positions that we can talk to our legislators about last year there were a lot of attempts to sneak legislation through and if you remember there was the attempt to try to make us partisan and then there was attempts to do other things. Um, you know, we were lucky to get by with our driver's ed money at the end. Um, 
and the teacher assistants, as you know, they changed the uh, that and lost. We lost our flexibility, and thus we've had to uh, do some uh, financial annex to save 80 jobs of our teachers, so that we wouldn't lay off 80 teachers. So, if you go to page two of this, Kelly, I think you're operating this monster. You don't need it. The letter is optional, but this is more the meat of it. So as you can see in page two, we start with the low performing grading. Um, if you remember last year, Linda Johnson did a very good job of fighting for us and she was able to extend for one year uh, back to page one or two, please. She was able to extend for one year the grading of the 15 point grading uh, in the 17, 18 year. We're supposed to go to 10-point grading, so whatever great things that we're able to do with our schools that are in that uh, had uh, somewhat questionable grades, they're going to be worse. And guess what? Some other schools are going to get worse. So the grading is only going to go down in 17, 18. Um, I, I believe Mr. Harrison put in there that the request would be to change the current grading formula, which Mrs. Johnson also. Uh, has bought for to a 50-50 weighting um, at the minimum. And North Carolina currently averages 53% free and reduced lunch as an average across the whole state. So that wouldn't be too out of line for a state average. Um, also, maintain the 15-point grading scale. Um, and uh, de designate that improvement as permanent and not subject to yearly revision. Um, so, any comments on this particular item? Okay. Last year I got the impression, and I hope I don't step on any toes in, in this, that, that the state legislature announced through the newspaper that, um, and media that something was being considered, and that um, we then found ourselves rapidly writing emails to legislators saying, do this, don't do that, provide this, don't provide. Well, by that time, the deal's done. And, 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 and the news is announcing what is eminently going to be uh, voted on uh, in the legislature. But many agreements have already been reached by that point. And it seemed to me that something like this, if we, could, we could keep it simpler and just more or less use the state school board associations on agenda verbatim if we chose to, but trying to put in Cabarrus County particulars and demographics and, and specifics and, and, and how it affects our, our neighbors and the neighbors of our legislators here in Cabarrus County, I thought would be more um, impactful and would get out in front of <coughs> the um, uh, issues that might arise in the short session of 2016. Um, and to provide this to all persons running for all legislative uh, positions. But um, I was just hoping that we could come up with something that would be truly impactful and exp express to current and prospective legislators uh, our, the, the will of the board on these matters. Didn't want it to be quite this complex, but it became that complex. But again, the desire is to make our, our legislators understand uh, our position on these topics. And then today comes the other um, discussion of uh, staff and uh, or this, the um, uh, retirement plan and the state benefits discussion of changing a health insurance plan from 80-20 to 70-30 and, and what that would do to our staff as well. But uh, um, all this stuff is moving really fast and um, um, Many things can happen um, before the public is aware of them, and I wanted to uh, hope the board also would like to find a way to articulate the main issues and and to be proactive instead of reactive, as we found ourselves ha having to be last year. Or, or that was my perception or of my um, reactiveness. Um, so I'm speaking personally on that point. I believe that this year we'll continue to have to be reactive. 
even if we put this out, we're really going to have to be much more proactive in getting out in front of our representatives and telling them how we feel about our our different issues. And they and and this does not capture all the issues. This is only some of the highlights. So let's just go through these point by point really quick. Um, but part of this effort was to help you articulate a little bit of a position to the legislature, not just reading off a position, but to have a little bit of a background as well. And um, so let's move on to page three, Kelly. Ms. Probes, sorry. All right, that one was dealing with the reduced testing assessments. Um, I don't believe that they got reduced. And actually, uh, I think federal government is now stepping in and making some mandates on us. Is that true, Dr. Van Heuchelen? For testing? Environment and the, the new ES essay, I believe, is the act is kind of trying to give states a little bit more flexibility to swing that pendulum back to be a little bit more moderate, which is probably a good move. Okay. Um, so we might see some action internally on this, maybe not from the right. legislature. Right. Yeah. They're not tying that decision at the state level to funding at the federal level, which is what kind of got us to where we are today. So do you think that this one really is a, is one that we ought to? keep on paper. This one here is on up. Now we've gone to number three. We're on number two right now. There we are. Reduce testing and assessments. Well, no, I think it still needs to be on the on the agenda in the sense of it's still it's now a state issue. And so our state needs to know that that is a feeling that we have that this kind of uh, obsession around assessments. Um, it, it, so now it's a state state decision. So I'd still press on that a little bit. Okay. Any builds to this? Well, I, I would just say, uh, you know, when I sent, sent my grading to Leanne Winter at the North Carolina School Boards Association, she pushed back that she didn't think that they deserved an F for this because they, the legislature did authorize this pilot project, which is going on this year in a few schools where they're trying three or four mini, yeah, mini quarterly assessments. So it's quarterly assessments instead of one big one at the end of the year. I don't, you know, I didn't think that really reduces the amount of testing, but um, she felt that that was a move in the right direction and therefore it should be acknowledged that they did at least do something, but. Um, they well, were you know, a D school and an F school, oops. <laughs> for us a D school and an F school is still pretty bad. So, <laughs> so anyway, I, I, maybe we should just change it to a D instead of an F, just to okay. be a little, little kind of. I think I made the comment last year at this time when we were putting together this um, legislative agenda that um, I'm fine with putting the request out to reduce testing from the state level, but I also think that um, as a local board, I think we need to be looking at our internal testing practices and making sure that we are not um, over assessing just at the local level, which um, uh, has been my feeling uh, since being on the board and we've, we've talked none about it and that's that's okay but we're going to expect the state to do something about it but we're not looking at our own practices very closely as a board we don't have discussions about it and that kind of thing maybe it's something we uh, need to do over the next 12 months um, before we come to the next legislative agenda yeah. same thing with the report card on page one, um, two I guess um, I'm kind of reminded that my kids brought home report cards, um, all four of them, and uh, for me to complain about the report card but not look at the content and the reasons for that, uh, those grades um, would, you know, I don't, I don't think I would be doing my job as a supervisor of those children. Now, I don't think um, we, as a board, have discussed, you know, maybe some of those low grades that, that we have received and that sort of thing. So that, those are just my thoughts. Mr. Chair, since you ask. Thank you, Mr. Powell. And, and I believe that, and we haven't really talked about this, but Dr. Lauder and I, because we didn't get the retreat like we'd like to, we, we had to leave out some major components in it, and uh, we need to do a strategic plan. 
and so that will probably force us back to this table or these tables um, in a short order to begin looking at our, our data, um, looking at the results that Dr. Louder got from his talkabouts at all the different schools and with the, with the different uh, staff at all the schools as well as the parents, and then to formulate our own new strategic plan that Dr. Louder now owns and that he will use as his uh, marching orders to go forward. So we'll need to do that probably in the next month or so, and I believe during that discussion, exactly what you brought up, Mr. Powell, I believe is when we can begin talking about that, those issues. Do you believe, you think so? Yeah, I'm not sure. We, we were going to, I mean, the plan is first to have a new strategic plan in place when the new year begins July 1, and Dr. Probst is leading that, and Mr. Fail um, is a big part of that. Um, and to be honest with you, we lost that day through the retreat, um, and it is going to be something that's going to take a little bit more. I don't think we can do it at one of these sessions. So even when you say, well, we need to do that in the next month, then you're out to March. And I would say that I don't know if we can wait until March. So that is one thing that we do need to talk about. And so um, I know that Mr. Powell sent some questions in the past of like, when are we going to find that information from the information gathering sessions? And when are we going to look at our performance data? Well, both of those two things would be part of the process that Dr. Probst and Mr. Fail are working on. Those are great starting points to say, okay, let's look at this information and then decide what do we want to focus on for the next, the next three years. So we really need to, if we're going to do that outside of two meetings, then we need to set a start time for that because it will take five or six months to be in place by July. Well, the, the rhetorical question is, is how, how long will it take for you folks, for your team to be ready to uh, have that, begin that process? Dr. Probst was ready, he's ready now. We're ready okay. To go. All right, board members, think about, look at your calendars. We don't have to do it right now, but look at your calendars. Send me back some dates. Um, it will be sometime during the week, and we'll have a called meeting to talk only about that that subject. Okay. But, I mean, since we lost our weekend retreat after all, should we also look at a weekend? <laughs> <laughs> You're a working man, too. You should appreciate that. That's right. I'm a working man. Guess what? I live for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> but this is fun day. I, I know. <laughs> Look at your schedules and see if you have flexibility to do it. Um, I, I don't know, Dr. Probst, <coughs> what do you feel like the effort would be? How many hours do you think we would need to be locked up in here? hour to an hour and a half on some questioning over strategic planning and then the additional uh, questions that have come into the board uh, requesting data on testing and things like that we were thinking about two and a half to three hours the Wednesday night worked really well for I think most of the Cabarrus County School staff as opposed to that Saturday um, we appreciated the the 530 to 8 o'clock 830 as opposed to a Saturday all right. Can people make that? We'll begin looking at your calendars for a, a beautiful Wednesday night that you want to take up with a talking strategy. <laughs> Let's move on to page three. My intent is to go through all 12 of these items, so we don't have to talk about them all, but you know, I just want to make sure that everybody's gone through this document. This is the sales tax refund exemption. Uh, as you well know, the school systems do not get sales tax refunds, but county government gets it, state government gets it, all the colleges around the state get it, a hundred and some colleges, all the charter schools get it. Just about every nonprofit in the state gets it, but we don't. Uh, so I believe that that's a little bit of an inequity and that this one is allowing for us to get the same benefits that everyone else gets. Is it possible for um, this probes to give us an estimate of how much we're losing because of that? How much do we pay in sales tax each year? And Ms. that's Plus. exactly what I'm asking through my page through here, specific impacts upon Cabarrus County. In that kind of exact, you don't have to answer exact the number, dollar. just say, is that right. easily? Okay. All right, page 
uh, item number four is the school calendar. And I have been to enough calendar meetings now to know that this year was a real tough one. Next year is tough. Uh, we don't have a lot of room for error. Um, we had a few snow days here, and I think that's, I don't know if it's taking all of our spare time out, but we but we're doing by hours now rather than days and uh, because the calendar has gotten so reduced. Uh, this is to ask for flexibility from the legislature to allow the local school systems and in concert with our local commissioners to take control of our calendar and to do what's best for our community rather than having it edicted based on someone else's needs. And right now the state tells us when we can start and basically when we can end and somehow figure it out between that. All right. Any comments on that one? Seeing none, let's move on. Uh, number five is school technology. Uh, there was a judgment of $747 million. Uh, and I don't, uh, back in 2008, the court found that the state had not been consistently, or had consistently failed to fulfill its constitutional obligation of putting money in the uh, school technology funding whenever they collected civil penalties, fines, and forfeitures. $747 million to cross the state if you do it per capita, then Cabarrus County would get about $15.9 million based on its current population, something in that range. That would go a long way to uh, relieving some of the county's need, uh, responsibility to us for technology and trying to outfit our classrooms. Um, I don't know right now, I hear that there's absolutely no chance this will ever happen, but I believe that it's incumbent upon us to talk to our legislators because they, they are touting an $800 million surplus in their budget, but they don't recognize the fact that they have a, an obligation. So um, to me, they have a 700, they have about a 30, $53 million surplus. All right, next one is teacher assistant funding. And in this one, as you remember, we did get uh, a lot of additional TAs added to the mix, but at the cost of 80 teachers here because we lost flexibility. So the state gave us flexibility. And what year was that, Kelly Klutz? Was that like 2011 or 2010 that we got the flexibility for teachers and TAs? But it's something, something back in those days. So we've been operating for almost you know four to five years under this technique of uh, hiring and now all of a sudden they changed the rules and you know thank goodness we were in uh, good enough shape to be able to uh, not have to riff 80 teachers so we're asking in this one is that they return the flexibility for the school districts but maintain the maintain the key a funding at its current levels um that will get any but This next one is the combo teacher principal compensation. Uh, they have been rewarding teachers at the, at the, who have less tenure than, well, they don't have as much tenure as some of our older teachers and the, the teachers that have more time with our system and, and in the state have not been able to participate in the raises. Not only that, the principals are ranked about 50th in the nation as far as compensation and best NC um, Dr. Mr. Harrison you were at that forum when best NC gave us that presentation they actually reported the same thing and uh, that the principals in North Carolina are extremely underpaid compared to the rest of the nation so <clears throat> this one here is a is a, a, a plea to have them do something about the uh, principal All right, we're going to number eight, which is fund aid stability. This is near and dear to one person in our midst heart. Kelly, you want to talk about this one? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've given some examples at the bottom. If, if you remember last year, there were three bills uh, that were floated up to the legislator trying to have us give a portion of our fund aid funds to charter schools and the charter schools are fighting desperately to get 
the monies that we work really hard through our frugalness to uh, to save and use for our our students. Um, yet they do not want us to know what their fund what their balance fund balances look like. And some charter schools have fund balances that are, are probably in excess of their entire budget. Uh, but if you'll see on the, the 2016 request, there's some dot points uh, about the areas that they're trying to get money from, like grants for federal appropriations, local sales tax refunds. You know, it's not like we get much from local sales tax, but we did a little bit of, and they want that too. So um, uh, indirect costs, reimbursements for everything except Medicaid and Medicare, uh, fees for actual costs, federal appropriations made directly to the LEAs unless it's specifically stated where they're supposed to be if we if but they don't appropriate money like that and then also some kind of supplemental property tax revenue even if the charter school is located outside the taxing district so there are charter schools that are beyond our borders that would want some access to our funds so um, I believe this is something we really need to carry to the forefront because we could lose a lot of flexibility if we lose that one. I thought Kelly gave a great explanation of it when we were in budget the other day. She gave a perfect example of it. She said, like, for instance, if a, a school, say we had one of our schools that went out and got a grant, so they went to a company and got a grant for their students, say, she gave a perfect example, say Hickory Ridge, say their principal went out and got a grant for their students at Hickory Ridge, say a ten thousand we were just talking, a ten thousand dollar grant for their students at Hickory Ridge, for their students for a certain program, like we we're just talking this tonight, for that ten thousand dollar grant, they went and got that grant for the students at Hickory Ridge School. Then the charter schools are saying, I want part of that ten thousand dollar grant, and that was for just those students at Hickory Ridge School. But they are wanting part of that money. Now that principal went out and got that money just for those students at Hickory Ridge School. Mm -hmm. And also in that same budget, we have, like for our Bible programs. I mean that that's in that same. You know, the, the people go and they buy, you know, they put money in for just that program. But the charter schools are wanting to come back and get that money for those programs. And the Bible programs are not supported by Cabarrus County Schools. Those are, that, that, that program's totally supported by the church community. And they pay all the, all the teachers and everything. So, you know, the church community works hard to maintain those teachers in the positions. And they teach a great course. But... You know, and we're so, one of the few systems that even do this. So yeah. when my church gives uh, a little bit to a local high school and hands them a check, apparently they would put that check in the school's version of Fund 8. It would go to, to the system level, but it would still be allocated or available uh, to that school in Fund 8. But according to the proposals that uh, have been floated in the legislature, some amount of my church's donation to that uh, Bible program, or for that, for the other matter, that Ingersoll Rand grant we talked about earlier tonight. Uh, sought by the school, gotten by the school, it would go into that fund eight bucket from the sounds of things. Don't let me overstate. And and would just be a pass through from us to the charter school, and the charter school having done none of the uh, load work to. Uh, in effect, deserve, in, in effect, to deserve. Um, I don't deserve the money in your in your wallet. I really don't. And that's kind of what's <laughs> going on in this. It, the the fund date thing is is um, it would be laughable if it weren't so um, uh, kind of infuriating. And what gets me? They're asking for local sales tax refund. Here we work to try to get it. We not we're not getting it yet. And the charter schools already get it, so they want theirs, plus what we we're trying to work to get now. So I don't think it makes a lot of sense. So we definitely want this one. <laughs> right, and folks, Dr. Phillips and I were at the policy conference in December, and that this message came through loud and clear. This is going to be a huge, huge issue this year, and 
charter schools are really gearing up to try to come after this fund eight. And I believe it's us to, up to us not only to get involved ourselves, but we really need to get parents to understand that, you know, for their public school, for their students, this is not good and the charter schools are not being forthright because they're not talking about what their fund balances are. And so that, that seems to not be a part of the conversation. And uh, it's hard to talk about the complexity of this because this is extremely complex. They make it very simple because they just say, we're just not getting the money. This is an example of something that can be pushed through the legislature very, very quickly with very little um, time for the public to uh, weigh in. Um, and it's probably the best example in the whole list of us getting ahead of a topic, a, a, an issue, and presenting it to our legislators so that they know, again, what we think on that topic before they get to Raleigh and, and are presented with other facts and figures and arguments uh, for or against uh, some action. Um, this is our opportunity to say, here's what this board believes on this topic. Ms. Probes, or Dr. Probes, could you skip number nine? Because I think we already talked about testing and assessing. That's a, a repeat. Go to this one. This one I don't believe is an issue yet, but it is beginning to gain steam throughout the country. It's called an education savings account. And basically, a parent or a guardian of a child or children would get the money for their child and be able to shop anywhere and use the money in any way to educate their child. Um, the big pitfalls are how do you, what's the quality control on this? How do you keep, and they, and they could use it for future expenditures, for any expenditure related to education. So how do you, how do you police a program like that? And um, it, it has started to gain some steam, as you can see, in Arizona and Nevada, but I believe that they're running up against some real issues with it, but it's still, is lurking on the on the horizon, and that means that people, are, parents could literally take their children out of school, get the money for their child from that district, and use that money to quote unquote provide education for their child. But we're not sure what the accountability measures are and how you would how you would maintain once you start getting uh, hundreds of thousands of families doing something like that. It, it would be a very difficult program to. Uh, police, um, but that's starting to gain some steam. Uh, the other one is expanding the use of school vouchers, um, though I don't believe that has affected us too, great, too greatly here. It, it does have an impact in that uh, private schools now become a portion to that, and if they continue to increase the amount of money associated with the voucher program, it will have more and more of an impact. So I believe uh, Right now, our, our focus should be on limiting the increases and keeping the school, this voucher program, uh, limited in its scope. And, yeah. As you may recall, in July, the North Carolina Supreme Court did find the voucher program constitutional. So there was a challenge. The district court had ruled it unconstitutional and went up, and, but that was the decision. So the legal, that piece of the legal challenge is resolved in terms of constitutionality, and I think, yeah, the issue is, is it going to expand and how much, and how much are they going to divert from public school dollars towards that? That's, that's really the issue. Yeah. Well, it, it, to me, it goes even further than that. There, there is absolutely no um, accountability for this money. There are no requirements of what you have to teach. ISIS could create a madrasa here in North Carolina and they could accept those vouchers. And so we would have North Carolina taxpayers paying for students to go get indoctrinated by ISIS. That, to me, is just incredible. Well, board members, are you warm to this legislative agenda at all? And if you are, um, any other thoughts? Do we do we need to take the grades off? Do we need to leave the grades on? Do we just need to reduce it down to the 2016 agenda? Uh, you know, I just gave you a doctor. I mean, Mr. Harrison spent a lot of time trying to pull this together so we could have a one look see at it. But you know, I'm not sure what form we want. Would like it to take. Open to splitting it into two different documents to have a legislative agenda that's short instead of 12 pages is really 
I think, a little bit too there, much. There isn't much more time to um, uh, for this to be effective in the current uh, election cycle. Um, so uh, these can be, they're, they're unrelated, so it doesn't matter quite uh, how we order them. They're, they're not exactly prioritized in here. Um, and for example, the, the voucher issue you know, might be, on one hand, it's constitutional. On the other hand, don't expand it. But how we play uh, uh, or, or take a position on that you know, is kind of up to us. But I, I would just like, in theory, to get to a, uh, a document next week that is no longer a draft that we could vote for and actually implement and distribute, um, which, I mean, which is no longer draft as of Sunday night, I'm sorry, Monday night, and is our, is our formal stance on, on these issues um, without um, going to hold a whole lot of revamping of, of the whole thing. Given the time it takes to create this and the time that it may take to change it, I support it completely in its current version and want to put it on the consent if anybody's, everybody's okay with that. Well, I do believe that a lot of it is in a draft form and it's not really presentable completely. Uh, it does need some more um, editing and content to it. Can I make a motion that you edit it and <laughs> clean it you, up? You can, you can make that motion, but one Mr. attempt Harrison, was, to, you, was you done to do that. And, and I believe that we asked um, the board to um, weigh in. I'm not sure if anyone received any additional comments on this draft as it is. Um, as it is, would not be very effective. Uh, English major in me, I, I think it's a, uh, too much of a draft in its current form and needs much more substance to it. And, 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 and I'll be delighted to work on it and in, in hopes of substantive input from my, my peers um, there. Now, uh, send your cards and letters to David Harrison by Sunday night, please. Thank you. They love Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Powell. I appreciate it, Rick. If, if you will, try to get David your comments by Thursday to give him a little time. And then he can email us the copy, and then he'll give it, and then we can get it to Aileen so that she can put it on the board docs by Monday morning. All right? Does that sound good? So did we answer the question, did we want the grades included or not included? Well, Mr. Powell made uh, a recommendation that we include it. I haven't heard anybody else, so I don't know. Not either way. Yeah. We can just make it single-spaced rather than triple-spaced and quadruple-spaced. So... All right, so with that said, everyone agree Thursday you'll get your comments to Mr. Harrison if you have any other builds for each. And just pick an item and, and work on that one item. Don't work on all of it. In fact, if you know everyone picks an item and works on that one item, I think that will help David out a lot. You don't have to work the whole document. So I mean, there's six other people in here, and, and we don't have to do all 12 of these. Obviously, the last three look like they could probably fall off if we wanted them. And there are links within the document to the State School Board Association's own agenda, but it's at a higher level and much more general, so um, you can confirm or cross-reference that way if you want. Yeah, and part of our dis dysfunction here is that the School Board Association will not have their document out probably until next month because the session doesn't start until April, so they're not endeavoring to get their information on the same level as us. I don't think they feel the pressure of the primaries like we feel. Well, Mr. Powell made a recommendation for consent. And so if you want to put it, I think we should put it on action so at least we approve the document. Yeah. Because I hate to consent something that I haven't seen. <laughs> All right. So, so it will be on the action, Ms. Monroe, and we will do the best we can to get you this. Don't worry, it'll be available to you by Monday morning. Yes, my goal would be to send it out to all of you by Sunday night. Okay. All right, board members, guess what? Section 6, what does it say? I made the motion that we Second. Who seconded that? David Harrison. 
All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Oppose? Tim? <laughs> <laughs> okay.